Welcome everyone to the Thailand Update 2021. I know people are joining us as we speak, so I won't say anything terribly important for the next few seconds. Um, just to say this is a, a great opportunity to get people together and have a discussion about a variety of, of issues. We have been running the Thailand Update for a few years now. We started it back in 2015 and it's become a, a kind of popular regular event. We're very grateful to the support that we've had from the Weatherhead East Asian Institute for this event since 2015. Um, it's been a really fantastic adventure supported by the New York Southeast Asia Network. This year we are branching out a little bit because uh, the Nordic Institute of Asian Studies uh, here in Copenhagen, where I am at the moment, is co-sponsoring the event. So it's a joint event between three partners today. So what we've typically done in the past with the Thailand update is a kind of overview of different things that have been going on in Thailand. We've typically had people talking about politics, about uh, economy, foreign policy, society, justice, media, and a range of issues. We're not quite doing that this year. We decided to focus in on a topic and make this very much a thematic update which is a little bit different in style from what we've done before it's also a bit different in that usually we're up on the 15th floor of the international affairs building gazing down over manhattan during our coffee breaks uh, and lunch breaks and now we're going to have to imagine uh, all of that but nevertheless perhaps we can try to to replicate some of that the feeling that we have in the the physical event and also the great thing about doing this online instead of in person is that a very much larger number of participants will be able to join than we've ever been able to pack into those rooms in the International Affairs Building in the past. So the theme that we're focusing on today is that of um, political protests revisited. As most of you following Thailand will know, there are a large number of demonstrations that took place last year, many of them inspired and initiated by student groups that called for uh, the resignation of the government, that called for revision of the constitution, and after the 10th of August, in a, a very, very important protest event that took place at uh, the Rangsit campus of Tamasat University, they are also calling for reform of the monarchy and breaking a lot of taboos in terms of previous discussions about Thailand. So we wanted to focus this year on the, the question of protests and bring together a number of people who've been working on related issues. One of the proximate reasons for that is that uh, along with Aim Simpeng, uh, Sawani Alexander and Ganokrat Lechusakun, uh, we were able to put together a special section of critical Asian studies. So four articles about the 2020 protests are already out uh, and we'll be hearing about those papers from those presenters tomorrow in the second session. So because of the time difference issue doing this virtually, we try to do it in such a way that we can have people in the US in the morning, in Europe in the afternoon and in Southeast Asia and especially Thailand in the evening kind of all tuned into the same event. That's the plan that we had for this, uh, this gathering. And that means that instead of doing it all in one day, we do it in two afternoons, European time, two mornings, New York time, two evenings, Thailand time. So this is where we're up to. We're going to have two sessions today and two sessions tomorrow. After the session today, we'll have a virtual reception, which is something we've never tried before. We'll go over to a different Zoom link and try to use the breakout rooms of Zoom so that you can mix and mingle with people that you might have met uh, had we uh, actually been able to get together in New York or somewhere else for a physical conference as we've done in the past. So that will be a variant for us. Okay, so this brings me to our first session. We've always done the tie updates in a very, very kind of cheap and cheerful manner. We've never had anything fancy. We've never had a keynote speech um, before. We've been sort of non-hierarchical in that sense. And we, but we sort of have to do something special this year because another proximate reason for focusing on the topic that we're focusing on is an incredibly important book that appeared last year, which is this book, Moments of Silence 
by Tong Shui Wen who's who's here with us today. It's a book that focuses on, and the subtitle tells it all really, the unforgetting of the October 6th, 1976 massacre in Bangkok. It's Hawaii University Press book. Tong Shui Wen Ishikun needs no introduction to most of you. I know it's a cliche to say that, but in this case, it's really true. He's such a a huge figure in Thai studies. We all know his incredibly important book, Siam Mapped, and we've been eagerly awaiting this very important book, which in many ways helps us to think about and to understand what has been going on in Thailand more recently uh, in a different way. So it's a kind of um, synchronicity about the appearance of this book in 2020 and the re-emergence of student protests in 2020 that made me feel like we really, really had to bring Tong Shai here. And I'm so sorry we weren't able to uh, host him and entertain him and have a, a dinner as we normally do uh, in one of the restaurants around the Columbia campus. But th that, I, I owe you, Tong Shai, for another time. The dinner uh, we'll have to have when we're able to travel again. But it's really a great privilege to have Tong Shai with us. Um, he is, as, as many of you know, Professor Emeritus of History at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And we're going to have a chance to talk about his book and also to talk about how themes and issues in this book relate to things that have been going on in Thailand more recently. So Tong Shai, welcome to the Thailand Update. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. This is a, a great pleasure and privilege and something I've been looking forward to for a long time. So. We mentioned the book, um, and I know you've given a number of other talks about the book. I would, if people really want to hear Tong Shai talk at length about the book, I'd recommend the University of Michigan talk, which I think you did in January, and that, that is on mm -hmm. YouTube. And there you show a lot of images and talk through the book in a much more systematic way than perhaps we'll have time to do today. But for those who aren't yet in, in a position to say that they've read the book, Maybe you could tell us a bit about it. I and mean, it's a highly personal book, but it's not primarily a memoir. Can you explain how the writing of Moments of Silence came about? Uh, it has been a long process. I have in mind for a long time. The first rule I have in mind, I have had in mind is that I'm not going to write a memoir. And second thing is that I'm not going to write what happened on that morning. I want to try to talk about the massacre in such a way that, uh, I mean, I believe the other people have talked about what happened in the past um, some years. When they first thought about it, nobody talked about it at all. This is about 20 years ago. But even that, I think is not the place where uh, I want to write anything that people could say that kind of typical explanation of a massacre, what political context, who did what. I try to avoid that. At the same time, I have this idea in my all the time about memory studies. That's the influence from World War II anniversary, Holocaust anniversary. So at that time, I thought back about what happened in Thailand that time, 20 years ago, now 40 years ago. Uh, so I have been doing this for about two decades, slowly. At the same time, this process, uh, parallel with the process that I, I would call memory project for October 6th massacre. I mean, try to dig up more information, try to learn more about relative try to find the body of my friend. If you, if people read uh, one chapter, it's about finding the body of my friend. That's all the same process of writing the book, the same process of memory project in actual memory project in Thailand. At the same time, it's, it's hard to say, but let's say to make it short. It's the same process of myself. It's the same process myself. You can say, somebody says it's a catharsis, that's fine. But it's the same process myself of making sense of what happened, making sense of myself. Right, yeah, that's, that's a kind of a, a great summary of how it comes across to me as a reader. I guess to understand what's, what's in the book and it's, 
It's a big book. It's a long book. There are 10 core chapters. We may not have time to talk about all of those chapters right here and now, but perhaps I could focus in on three key words that appear in the title that in many ways help to define, uh, in, at least to my understanding, what the book is about. And the first, it's it's in the subtitle, not in the not in the not before the colon, but it's still it leaps out, of course, uh, and overpowers all the other words in the title. Is the word massacre at the core of this book? There's a terrible episode of violence that looms large in Thailand's modern political history that you were centrally involved in. How does the book help us to understand that violence differently? Uh I'm not sure we understand the political mass violence in Thailand that much, even though it happened too many times, too many times over the past 50 years. I mean, not just uh, the, the October 73, 76, the May uh, 92, and then 2010. But if you count, uh, Duncan, you're more familiar with this. If you count the, the, all, all the major mass violence in the South, mm -hmm. I would say maybe a dozen over the past 50 years. But typical explanation usually focuses on political context and action, who did what. I think if, I, if we take a different approach, in fact, such as you did in your book on Thailand South, tearing apart the land, we kind of step back and, and look at it from a broader perspective, we can see some common threads across those political violence, mass violence in Thailand. That one, although people talk about it, but let's say I, I, I don't think it's enough. There are far more to, 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 to examine, far more to, to talk about that. I take that approach to see the October 6th, not just the political factors. In the book, I focus on what happened and political factors mainly in the first two, maybe only one chapter, chapter two. The rest of them is more about uh, how, how, about the silence, about the, the enigmatic effect, the long lasting impact of violence uh, of such a scale without justice or closure. It's about changing memory and many reasons for silence for many people. So in, in other words, uh, the October 6th massacre is not just political, but ideological and cultural ones too. For example, the palace action and inaction on that day is very much ideological and cultural factors are part of that, that make the palace role, palace action and inaction uh, in such a such a way on, on, on in, in the massacre. So I, I hope that yeah the book uh, says something more, asks something more about those factors, non-political factors, and people, people, I mean I hope that contributes something to people think about other massacre, other mass violence in, in that way too. Right. I mean the the Massacre is the word that, that looms largest in the title, but it's probably the second largest word right there before the colon is, is the word silence. Um, why has there been so much silence even to this day about exactly what happened on the 6th of October, 1976? I think first fear, fear for retaliation by the royalist state. Second, shame, or at least uneasiness, discomfort among the victims, among the perpetrators, and among the public, and the public too, a discomfort to talk about it. For different reasons, of course. I mean, the, un the uneasiness of for each group may be, may be down to every individual, but for different reasons. And uh, for the public, and then the third one is, is evasion for the sake of superficial and immediate peace which in Thailand they call reconciliation. I think those three, three, I mean, fear, shame, and evasiveness, evasion, uh, for different reasons at different times, at different degrees, to different groups, uh, depends on the changing political context over for the past 40 years. 
after the massacre. That that's the main main thing, main content of the book. Right. Um, which naturally leads us to the the third question, which is this this word unforgetting. I guess. Um, you know, I, I puzzle over the words slightly because I wonder what's the difference between unforgetting and remembering, um, and and also the moments. I guess there's a moment. Of, this is a, there are moments of silence. There's a moment of unforgetting. Uh, could you say something about this word unforgetting and in what sense uh, you'd say that the seventy six massacre has been or was unforgotten, and and when that took place? I I intentionally. Uh... I didn't use the word unforgotten because people are too familiar with the word. I used the word unforgetting. I'm not sure it's, it's good English, <laughs> but yeah. I want to, you can say, I want to kind of cause a kind of, the word unforgetting would be a bit disruptive to the common familiarity with unforgotten. Right. Disruptive because I want to emphasize the condition of memory, which cannot be voiced out the inability to articulate the memory in public. So it's not fully memor fully remembering or fully mm -hmm. forgetting, no. It's a kind of emphasize the, the, the discomfort, the conspicuous uh, state of memory between remembering and forgetting. The, the kind of state of memory in between and in my argument, I hope it, 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 it uh, is, is clear in my argument that it's visible and loud, but it's also absence, absent a lack of voice. So an inability to articulate, but people know it is. Inability to create a, a, a systematic or let's say a, a narrative, a clear narrative of what happened and why it's painful but people recognize that, yes, it is, that kind of condition. Uh, we can think about silence in music or theme. Those are, I would call, meaningful silence. So I, I want to focus, or focus on, on, on that, that silence of that kind. That's why I call the unforgetting rather than unforgotten. I believe that the October 6th memory, the unforgetting, the silence of it is a haunting condition. And I believe that in fact, it's common to every society, but uh, I think it's more striking in an authoritarian society in which weapons may not be the primary means of control, but that society with strong ideological and cultural repression, uh, such as Thailand, I think silence of that of this kind, a liminal state between remembering and forgetting mm -hmm. would be would be more in place. Right. Yes, I was actually about to follow up by asking you whether this was exactly what you're saying, a liminal space between memory and, and forgetting. And who is in the liminal space? Is everybody in that space or are the state side as well in the space or is it just yeah. the, the participants or the the Public. I wouldn't say everybody, of course, because not, mm -hmm. not many people have memory of it. I would say people who have memory of it, yes. which means I argue that a lot. Yes. I mentioned in, in the book, I mentioned, uh, I, I have examples, but let's say in, to, to generalize, I would say both the victims and perpetrators for different reasons, and also the public. Public means, uh, I'm not sure who, but let's say a large number of people who know the incident, who remember the incident, but it doesn't mean everybody, of course. So they, they are kind of in the liminal state, such as, for example, for, for the victims, they don't want to voice out because they're not sure yes. the retaliation. For the families of the, of, of the dead, they're not the same victim as the, as the ex-leftists, but they're also silent. As recently as 2016, when uh, we, I mean, my, I have a team of research assistants, mm -hmm. try to contact them. Mm -hmm. uh, so many of them still refuse to interview, refuse to give, to, to talk to us because they're still uh, in fear. They're still in fear. Uh, for the perpetrators, over time, uh, political situation has changed. I think 
they know, they know that the public, the society at large, did not support the action on that day. Did not support the killing. But as far as I have talked to 20 people, former enemy, you might say a former mm -hmm. adversary, yes. none of them feel shame. None of them feel remorse. They just know that it's not time for them to speak up. They boast, they boasted in the first year after the massacre, mm -hmm. boasted of their accomplishment. But since then they have gradually into silence until when I met him, met them in the mid 2000, the, a group, a group of real killer, the real killer who, who boasted about, yes, they are the real killer. Uh, they still laugh at it, but let's say they won't speak out. Many of them, including a number of red gores, the infamous group that people blame, blame them a lot. I mean, attribute the killing to them. In fact, they argue that they didn't do. They feel betrayed. Betrayed because of what? Because they did the right thing. They did good things, saved the country. But right. the public, the right. society never honored them. Yes. So yeah. they went down to silence. I mean, I hadn't planned to ask you this, but now you're talking about it. I mean, what was it like to talk to those people with that kind of view and given your own history with them? Oh, it, <laughs> maybe, maybe we don't have enough time. No, it's a hard all, thing. All I can say is that. Hard thing to do. All I can say is that there are a number of questions I should have asked them. I want mm -hmm. to ask them more. And my assistant at the time encouraged me to go back. Mm -hmm. And in the end, I refused. I said, right. that's enough. I can't do it. Yes, understandable. <laughs> yeah, very understandable. Yes. So as, as I, I said in my opening remarks, we're obviously focused in this, this year's tie update and the conference as a whole on this theme of protests and we're very, very by, by the way, Duncan, Duncan yeah. give me a, a few moments. Oh, please, yeah. Instead of, uh, apart from the three keywords in the title. Oh, yes. I would invite anybody who's interested in the book to look at the three main components of the cover. Mm -hmm. That's how you can conceptualize the book as well. The hanging, yes. the palace, and the emptiness on the cover. That's yes, it. Yes, right. Yeah, it's a little bit hard to see, I think, on the Zoom, but okay. yes, all those three elements are very, very that's strong. A, that's all I want to add. No, that's, a really, that's really illuminating. Yeah. So, you know, it had been a kind of... Um, cliche to say, well, students used to be at the center of political protest and, and political activity in Thailand in the 1970s. And after 1976, they ceased to perform that kind of role. And most of the protests that we had since students didn't play a leading part in, in, in those protests. It really makes us ask questions about what were the parallels, the similarities, the differences with earlier events. So could you tell us from your own knowledge and, and research and of course having been there as, as one of the leaders of that protest what was the nature of the political protest that you and your fellow students were engaged in during the period that led up to the 6th of october massacre what were you protesting about on the 5th of october exactly well uh given that i, I look at the program I, I i see that many people would focus more on the movement today so I, and, and on the other hand, I'm pretty far away. Mm -hmm. And I would say that over the past 40 years, many protests, at least I have a friend, I have some friends active in those movements, or at least being journalists in those movements, mm -hmm. movement, I can ask, I can contact them. But this is the first time I have nobody. My friends all retire, all right. getting old. So right. I am, I'm pretty much much more removed from the movement today. Mm -hmm. So I would I would leave the, the discussion on the movement today to other people. All I can say is just one point. If we talk about comparison between 40 years ago and mm -hmm. today, the movement today is not formed or inspired by a systematic ideology like the one in the 1970s. The current movement, in my view, is primarily the responses to the hyper-royalist authoritarian condition in Thailand. 
not only in politics, but uh, the, what the, the hyper-royalist condition, authoritarian condition that I talk about is pervasive in every social institutions, in everyday, in everyday life. I think the movement today inspired by, it's a response, it's a reaction to that. The movement in the student movement in four, four, I mean, 40, 44 years ago, or even more than that, in, since 1973, it may start as an as a anti-military, but by 1976, it's a movement that was inspired, influenced pretty much by an ideology, mm -hmm. by the Maoist ideology. Yeah. That is a major difference. This nature, the, current na the nature of the current movement, uh, I, I believe, facilitate or allows them to become much less organized, much loose, much loosely uh, movement in which this is quite contrast to the strong but rigid one in 1976. In other words, I think the, drive, the government often try to find the driving force, the pre people or person or organization, the hidden conspiratorial movement mm -hmm. behind the student. I think the driving force behind the protest movement today is a royalist authoritarian mm -hmm. regime itself. Right. Absolutely. And uh, as you're already hinting, I mean, monarchy has loomed very large in the 2020 protests, as I said, from the August 10th protest at, at, at Tamasart Rangsit campus when the 10, 10 demands um, on the 10th of August about Rama the 10 uh, uh, announced. Monarchy is also a sort of a constant presence in your book. There's that, as you know, just noted, the little picture of the palace in the bottom left hand corner. Uh, of the uh, the front cover, was monarchy something that student protesters were directly concerned with in 1976? Were you thinking about monarchy, or were you thinking about other questions in those days? A lot, <laughs> <laughs> a lot. Well, we didn't we didn't say much. Right. In the movement uh, at that time, 73 to 76. I think the the student movement, the the, the even pop more than student. Mm -hmm. extend to other groups in the in the society we started off as an anti-military rule but around 1975 mid-1975 to be more precise the movement turned left yes very left partly informed by the knowledge the awareness of the role of the monarchy and partly not both cause and effects. I mean, partly informed by, and also after that, we pay attention more to the. A large segment, I would say, a large segment of the activists and the public know about the monarchy's politics, mm -hmm. monarchy strong anti-communism and and even anti-democratic politics. We talk about the monarchy a lot among ourselves, among the activists. And yes, we did talk about the monarchy in public forum, such as in songs, in public discussion and so on, but most of the time in coded language right. or evasively. We didn't do it explicitly as the protest today because at the time, I think, I still think it's right. We understand that with the strong royalist anti-communist atmosphere at the time, mm -hmm. if we cross such a line, it becomes dangerous to it become it become it jeopardizes our own movement. Right. That's it. That's why we talk a lot, yes. but rarely explicitly, almost not explicitly. Right. And another theme that comes out very strongly in your book that, that resonates with those of us who've been following more recent developments in Thailand is, is this media problem, distortion, misrepresentation, uh, what we would nowadays call disinformation, um, which you very much faced as a, as a movement. Do you see similarities uh, between what's going on now? Or do you think the mainstream media is now better or, or much the same as it was in 1976? We talk about mainstream, right? Yes. We talk about TV and major dailies. Okay. 
I think the mainstream media in Thailand, uh, especially the electronic media, the radio at the time is radio and TV. Now radio may not have more much influence. The TV to some extent, to a great extent, I believe. The mainstream media in Thailand either belong to the military or the government. So they all belong to the state. Mm -hmm. Even the one run by private companies, they rent or they lease, they get the concession to run those, those media. So all controlled by the state. And in October 6, in, in 76, the military took it back and controlled the whole media scape in the country for days, for I think for months. So it, it, even the daily, the printed media, is all, they're all under control of the state. So I think it's the same situation then and now to the extent that I believe this one, I never do research. In fact, I, I read your books, Duncan. I read your books about your works on, on the media. I, I believe that submissiveness and working, I mean, operating in fear as it is integral part of the media culture. I, I put in that the media culture. Submissiveness and, 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 fear, live and fear is part of the media culture in Thailand. Their behavior, a lack of professionalism is horrible today as it was in the past. There's one different, in my opinion, in the past, the media had resisted the control much more than today. I think today the mainstream media has surrendered its professionalism and its responsibility to the public, even before the, any threat from the state, because their interest and, and their ideology are in line with, uh, with the ones of the state. So I, I as, as, as an observer, I think threat and control is not much needed when collusion and collaboration prevails, they don't need that. So the state today didn't resist, they become part of that. I don't know, people call it the state or civil society. Mm -hmm. if, if the old, old fashioned theoretical thinking separate between the two, in this case, I think this main function of civil society into the media, it, it's part of the state by collusion and by collaboration. The difference today is, is only that is, is, is availability of the social media beyond the state control. Yes. Um, well, I could say a lot <laughs> myself about this, obviously. Yeah, but you know I guess, and I haven't been in Thailand the past few months, but what people tell me is that if I had been, uh, if you didn't know, then you probably wouldn't be aware from mainstream media what the 10 demands that the students articulated on the 10th of August were. What what are the 10 points of, that, the, that need to be reformed right. about the monarchy? Right. Some reference might be made to monarchy reform, but the 10 points printed in mainstream media or announced on mainstream TV hasn't really happened. You've had to go to alternative media to get yeah. information. Yeah. And that's, that's very sad in 2020 and 2021, isn't it? I mean, another central question that, that comes up and there's obviously must be in our minds now um, again is that of impunity that those responsible for massacring civilians have never been brought to justice in Thailand I expect Tyrrell might say something about this later or, or for Jack but what's the relationship between the culture of impunity that we've seen in 76 92 2010 in the south as you say and the ways in which the current situation may unfold Impunity has always been part of the Thai state. I think in, in Tyrell's 2018 book, In Plain Sight, mm -hmm. it's about how impunity has been inseparable from the development of the Thai state, at least over the past 50, 60 years. Uh, impunity, she focuses more much on the, the, the authoritarian regimes at different times. I think Thai will, will, will say that more. In my study of Thai legal history, which I presented last year and published last year, impunity is integral to Thai jurisprudence. 
the whole ecosystem is built on providing the the prerogative. Impunity is a, a form, is a kind of prerogative the state always enjoy, enjoy. So the link between impunity in all those cases because the state always have, I mean, that prerogative. The state know to some extent, to great extent, how to get that impunity. And it looks like in the past seven, eight years, the Prayut regime, the Prayut regime, I use this word, I know it's Pajak's word, but I use this word in broader sense than, him, than Prayut government, in the sense of people above and behind it, in the sense of beyond the extended regime, I mean, beyond the government, including the court. It looks like the Prayut regime in the past seven years is aware of its prerogative, its privilege, aware of that that they can use impunity. They're shameless. They take advantage of it. That's how they become shameless. It's like Trump. Mm -hmm. Keep doing what they did, even though it's wrong, shamelessly, because they know that nobody can touch them. And that is worrying for the, the current situation of the student protesters. Yeah. Because it's built in the state, it's built in the legal system. Yes, they can be pretty sure they're not likely to be called to account for whatever they do. Yeah. Um, in in other talks, I know in the in the Michigan talk, you give a very intriguing reference to chapter 11. You've talked, we've talked about how the book really has 10 chapters. And you've said that now after these recent protests and the opening up of previously taboo discussions about monarchy since the um, August 10th um, rally and so on, that you you would, if you went back, write a chapter 11. And at one point you read out, I think it seemed like the opening paragraph of, of chapter 11. Could you explain for people joining us today what what might be in this chapter 11 of yours that we're now, we're hoping there'll be a second edition, including this chapter 11, but perhaps you could give us a further preview. Actually, I haven't thought much about what the rest of them <laughs> right. uh, uh, I, I, at, at a talk in Michigan, talking about the book in particular, and in Thailand too, talking about the book, I, I have in mind that, oh, I didn't regret that I, I finished the book in, in before the what I what we see in 2020. But had I known or had I delayed the book about a year or two, I would have had the next episode. The book is about is about the mem changing memories and silence in the condition of changing political conditions, right? So I would say that the, the call for reform of the monarchy last year is huge. It's a huge next episode. So if I had I delayed the book for a couple of years, I it's impossible to miss, to ignore what happened last year. So I have written the first paragraph of chapter 11 <laughs> yes. introducing what happened on August 10th, the, yes. the, 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 the day that the student, the protest movement today announced the 10 point demand for reform of the monarchy. So I would say to keep the book coherent about the haunting memory of the massacre, chapter 11 would explain how the memory of the massacre has contributed to the rise of the youth movement today. I mean, I think in the, on that day, August 10, 2020, when they make announcement of the call for reform, mm -hmm. uh, the first paragraph that I explained it on the background, they show the clip, the clippings, the film yes. clippings of October 6. But the song is a song composed by the monarchy. Yes. And the song and and pictures on the screen are so disjointed, yes. they're disconnected. Right. Right. And after that, 10 points demand. So I think October 6, October 6 has been one of the entry 
put it that way, one of the contribution to the, to the thinking, to the awareness of the problem of the monarchy in Thailand today. I think with the weakening hyper-royalism, the youth of this generation has been receptive to the narrative that counter to the hopeless political conditions that they have experienced in, in, in their young lives. I think, I believe October 6th as memory is one of those counter narrative and a power one, a powerful one too. So that's how I, I would explain to keep and to keep the book coherent, how the memory contribute to the rise of the, of the movement today without trying to suggest that is the main thing or is the only one, no, 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 no. But it's, I think it's important one. But then I would then, the rest of the chapter, I would urge, I would talk about other massacre, other mass violence briefly in order to suggest that, to urge that we, we mean, I'm not sure who, Thai people should extend the memory project into other atrocities mm -hmm. of the Thai state. I believe that these memory projects have huge impacts, not only politically, but far beyond. Mm -hmm. In October 6th case, I believe it has impact beyond politics into history. Yes. That's why awareness of history today, awareness of the danger and contribution plus and minus of historical knowledge, the awareness about the monarchy, the awareness of uh, impunity is far beyond political actions. I think if, if investigation in memory project is done for the Takbai case, yes. for many other cases in the South, the issue about religion, issues about eth ethnicity, is about plurality in Thai society. Uh, it's not that, that those are silenced. No, 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 those, but let's say will become much more, more, I mean, on the agenda or the social agenda. And especially that as we talk, the need for, the need to end impunity in Thailand. We must end it. I would say that my, I, I would put emphasis on that point somewhere in the chapter, maybe at, at the end of the book is that the end of impunity is inseparable from establishment of democracy and rule of law in Thailand. Thank you so much. Yes, you're, you're reminding me that I have long said I was going to go back to Dak Bai and to that incident, which was so much the start of you know, why I wrote Tearing Apart the Land. And I talked to people who were involved in that and caught up in that. And we don't have any systematic, thorough examination and explanation of that incident. And that could easily be uh, another book in itself. And then there are all of the all of the other books that we could talk about that need to be written. But it's and as you say, this is this is why we're starting with this <laughs> historical perspective today, uh, which we haven't done in the past with the with the Thailand update. To be fair, we've been guilty of this presentism, and we try to uh, make amends for that. But yes, well, you've written an in incredibly important book about October sixth and the the unforgetting, the silence, the massacre. Let's go to some questions. We have a bit of time for some questions. We. We we're rather enjoying our conversation here, but there are some other people who want to jump in and say things. Let's see what we we have. All right. So John Brandon asks: the tragic events of October the sixth took place almost forty-five years ago. A person would have to be at least fifty years old to have some recollection of events. How much do you think young people protesting on the streets in twenty twenty know about, about October sixth? Does this event have any resonance in their thinking? Thank you. Uh, I think I have answered that already. Yes, they know. Mm -hmm. And and partly because it's no longer si complete silence. By the way, there's no total silence. Even the first 20 years, there's some kind of talk, talking. That's why I use the word unforgetting, the liminal state between memory, remembering and forgetting. Uh, instead of the, the, the event has been forgotten. No, no. So after the first 20 years has been there has been a, there was a breakthrough in 1996 to some extent, but uh, the, we can we can talk about the violence. We can talk about what happened to some extent, but we at the time 96 to about maybe last year, we have been unable to talk about who 
or why. We can't talk at all about the monarchy until last year. So I think the memory, so that's why the answer previously before, before mm. the, uh, the last the chapter, my chapter 11, I think October 6th has been one of the critical uh, contribution to the awareness of the youth movement today. They know it, partly because the memory project that has been going on in the past 20 years from mid nineties to today. Mm -hmm. And I, that's why I think I, I wish there are memory projects for many other incidents as well. Yes, and, and as you said, we saw it very vividly on that pivotal night of, of the 10th of August with the back projection on the stage as Rung is there making her pronouncement and then hurling the papers up into the air. It's all, so it, there's this weird cognitive dissonance of all the different things that are going on, but it, on one level it's extremely choreographed and it's highly referencing uh, these these very points, so we know, we know that it's there. Um, Okay, John apologizes for having got his question in before we'd already answered it, but anyway, it was worth, worth talking about a bit more. Uh, Pirasit Sing Tong asks, how does China's media censorship influence protesters in Thailand now? Huh. I'm not sure, I think it makes them angry. <laughs> yes. To make it short, it makes them angry. And right. it makes people turn, I'm not sure this is, this is, people like him or other people mm -hmm. might do some research. Mm. We keep talking about the decline of the mainstream media. Yes. In the in Thailand, I wish it is really true. <laughs> right. <laughs> I wish it's really true, but I, I have, I personally have no idea it's really true or not. But I think it draw, I mean, it drive people away from the mainstream media and to social media. Right, maybe I could just follow up. Yeah, yeah in what extent, I'm not sure. Maybe I could just follow up myself. The social media, but also these new online media and, and yeah. things like Prashatai and The Standard, The Reporters, uh, Voice TV, with the four that were banned in October very briefly. These are an, in an interest, talk about liminal space. They're in an interesting liminal space between yeah. social media and mainstream media. And most of the information has been coming from them, which is, that's a bit hardening, isn't it? <laughs> there's, some, there's something heartening in there for me that there is this new media space, uh, you know, are, which are you has its own that, issues. Yeah. Are you saying that be, the, the success of those, uh, I mean, social media and online news because the the bad quality of the mainstream media? <laughs> Partly. Yeah, absolutely. So people, since you couldn't find out what was going on from mainstream media, people turn to these online media, which all have their own shortcomings, but they, they are at least a new area of debate mm -hmm. and discussion, and they fed the social media streams that then people were, yeah. were forwarding. So there was something positive um, in all there. Okay, lots more questions. Oh, um... We're not going to be able to get through all of these. So let's see. Um, okay. I can't resist asking you um, whether you think that Thailand is a land of compromise, a sentence that we heard. <laughs> what, what do you make of, of, of a statement like that? It's the same as talking about reconciliation. Mm -hmm. After I released my group from prison in 1978, and that's a beginning of silence. I explained that in the book, why reconciliation becomes the, the powerful, uh, how, how to say, powerful discourse mm -hmm. in help silencing the October 6th. It's, I think reconciliation also came up after 2010, yes, 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 that's mm -hmm. right. I think the same thing. Uh, it's very elusive. I mean, it's hard to criticize. Right. At the same time, it's elusive because it 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 is not reconciliation, compromise, forgiveness. They're all good words turn bad in the way the regime use it, put it that way. So all three words. Right. Yes. Because they conceal, they hide it. They put things under the rug. 
without solving it. That's it. Right. Yeah. I'm not supposed to be answering the questions, but I would, I've, I've thought about this a lot before. And if you have reconciliation or compromise between two completely unequal parties, <laughs> then you're not meeting in the middle. You're, you're meeting on the side of those, those in and, power. Clearly. And we also see the, 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 how to say, the consequence. It means that think about those mass violence, mm -hmm. not even the mass one. Let's say, think about single case of Tanai mm -hmm. Somchai who forced yes. it to appear. If the rule of law has been straightforward effectively, I would say stop. Mm -hmm. Same thing with mass violence, maybe not completely stop because I don't believe in the completely never again. Right. Right. I think people can create mass violence, <laughs> the state. Yes. But let's say, I would say it's much more difficult to happen. In Thailand is too many times in the 50 years, too many times, partly because we reconcile, we compromise, why we do nothing to try to learn the lesson, to try to bring justice, to punish people who commit a crime. Right. So we end up with a normalization of mass violence, just as we have a normalization of military interventions um, and People just shrug their shoulders and say, "Okay, well, that's that's what usually happens." And I would say that the the what I what we mentioned a moment ago, the shameless uh, mm -hmm. use of the law in in the ways that the state and the court in Thailand today uh, they can do that partly because they never get punished. Right. Okay, another question. So this is from Rebecca Gontroff. Um, how have you found that the events of October 6th are remembered outside of Bangkok? Do you think the current movement is more geographically dispersed than in the 1970s and how might that impact outcomes? Immediately after the, the incident in 76, because the, the censorship and blockage of media and at the time they can block, no internet, only TV and dailies, right? The news to the outside Bangkok, even in Bangkok, even in Bangkok, they know that people knew that something happened. Some people knew more, some people knew less. Of course, I didn't know this because I, I was in prison, but I learned afterward that even in Bangkok, people heard of it, but not clear. And when some people who explain what happened, people tend not to believe because it's hard to believe that it happened to such a violent, such scale. So outside, outside Bangkok, I have no idea, but I believe that. Mm -hmm. I believe that it is that situation. So October 6th did not register much in the memory of people outside Bangkok. But again, not the direct experience of the incident, even as observer or even as people who read the news or who listen to the news. Uh, those, are fact, their, those are not the factors that bring back October 6th to their awareness. I think the memory project after mm -hmm. that, Thailand has changed. The differences in terms of media access and information access between Bangkok and uh, provincial other cities are not that much different today or in the past 10, maybe 20 years. And that's when the memory project about October 6 began too. So if, uh, if there is anything that prevent them, not prevent, let's say, make them less interested less interested in October 6 or, or maybe they have not uh, care about, they have not care about October 6. It's their politics, it's their interest as normal as people in every so any society. But I believe the differences between Bangkok and other provin provincial cities, I believe that it's not much different anymore in the past 10, maybe 20 years. Because they learned of October 6 not from direct experience, not from direct news, not contemporary. They learned about it as a part of memory. Right. Yes. I'm trying to find a question that would allow us to end on a slightly more optimistic note, but it's a little bit tricky because most of them don't really uh, lead us in that direction. Um, let me see. What can we say here? Um, I, I see, Duncan, yes. I see mm. one question, anonymous attendee. Okay, go ahead. Yes, you pick the last about one. Impunity. Yeah. 
<laughs> Even that, it hasn't changed. Right. It hasn't yeah. changed much over time. Yes. What hope does the country current young generations can afford? Yes. It is not optimistic note. So this is not the last. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> so then, can you just try to find some other more optimistic things? <laughs> right. But I, I like to answer that question because I think it it is important. Please. It will be hard for, I'm not sure for how long, but for this kind of issue, impunity, usually this is the lesson from, we learn from other societies. Usually the, the breakthrough come from small cases. Usually the, the yes. breakthrough can, let's say, it's hard to call for, open up, setting up the committee to examine the talk by massacre. The October 6th massacre is too mm -hmm. hard. But the breakthrough would come from smaller cases, much mm -hmm. smaller cases yes. that brought the state to justice and then extend that. I'm not sure because it depends not only on the cases, it depends on the right moment. It depends on the case that right. the case that will have huge impact. I'm not sure. But let's say, for example, one case which has been so far has not been successful. After the initial attempt to, to, to fight the case of Tanai Somchai disappearance, mm -hmm. I think that, that's very huge, that's very important. Yes. That very, that's a case that could send, uh, as you check impunity privilege, impunity uh, problem in Thailand, but so far, no, the state hold on to its power. It, it didn't crack on it, it, I mean, unsuccessful yet. But let's say my answer would be smaller cases, maybe singular cases, but have huge impact like that. But let's say it's a long fight. Even that case, suppose the nice old Thai case was successful. It's still a long way to go because it's in the legal system. Mm -hmm. it's, it's part of the formation of the, of the state in the past 50, 60 years, it won't be easy. Yes, I mean, that's a really important point. I mean, to me, the, the it's another terribly disturbing and, and awful case, but the Wan Chalom case and the way that uh, the, that disappearance was able to capture the imagination of so many young people was a very, very important case. Um, it seemed in some way to, to set the stage for the protests that then begin a, a few weeks later. Sometimes we don't quite know what what the case is going to be that will capture people's imagination rather than other cases. And yet that one, maybe young people could identify with Wan Chalum in some way that they didn't with other victims and that, that caused them to mobilize in a very spontaneous way around that issue. I'm afraid we're going to have to bring our conversation to an end. There are still many more questions, including some from my former students that I'd love to uh, mm -hmm. put to you, Tongshai. But uh, this has been you know, a, a fascinating conversation about some very difficult subjects. I'm really, really happy that we're able to have you here today to join the, the Thailand Update. And thanks so much to you for agreeing to talk to us and to all the people who ask questions, whether or not we answer them and all those who've been involved. It's been a, a fantastic session. So. Thank, Thank you. you so Thank much. you very much. All right. Thanks a lot. Right. Thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you also uh, to Duncan, Athena, and everyone at both Columbia University and the Nordic Institute for Asian Studies that has made this Thailand update possible. The first Thailand update, um, as Duncan noted, took place six years ago in early May 2015, just before the one year anniversary of the 22 May 2014 coup. I had spent the months after the coup watching the rising numbers of Article 112 or Les Majest cases in alarm. But I was also hopeful about opposition and gave a paper about the writing by political prisoners during that period. Um, and I especially focused on Zhao Tao Lip uh, or Littlefoot, a fable written by Pointed Munkong. In mid-August of 2014, Pontip, along with Batiwat Sodayem, was arrested and accused of Lesma Jest for the performance of The Wolf Bride, Jasao Mapa, a satirical play that was performed in October of 2013. 
On the 23rd of February 2015, they were each sentenced to five years in prison, which was reduced to two and a half years as they pled guilty. Pontiac wrote the fable Littlefoot and sent it out of the prison to a friend in one page uh, installments. It was then published by the independent media site Bacha Thai, first in Thai and then in English translation. The protagonist Littlefoot is a being of unknown age and the fable is about their journey in the fading light of one day. We know they leave home, but not the destination. Because the dark is looming, they must constantly decide whether to choose safety or risk. At the beginning of one installment of the fable, Pointip addressed her readers and wrote, quote, once upon a time, a truly once upon a time fable. It is heaps more fun to tell the fable than to write it down. I miss the children a lot and I have figured out what to tell them. Tell them I went to slay a dragon and I am in the labyrinth right now. Ha ha ha. Unquote. Of course, it's not actually funny the way one often uses the number five um, in Thai. It's often ironically. Um, I read the fable as an allegory, one that illustrated both Kwon Hip's experience in prison and that of her fellow citizens living under a dictatorship. She was released from prison in August of 2016 and immediately began writing a day-by-day -day account of her imprisonment. The result, her 884-page memoir, Man Tam Rai Rao Dai Ken Milet, or All They Could Do To Us, became an immediate, immediate bestseller upon its release in March of 2019 and remains one in 2021. At once a detailed, intimate account of her imprisonment, a general guide to surviving authoritarianism also emerges between the lines. And today I wanna to talk about the book in two registers. First, as an urgent contribution to the imagination of the new democratic society to be built after the end of dictatorship, which I have to say now, it looks like it might be a little farther away than it did in August of 2020. And then second, as an essential her story that challenges the existing histories and even narratives of politics and struggle in Thailand. I'll then conclude by reflecting on the resurgence of Les Majest cases and in a sense urge all of us to, to keep remembering this crisis uh, wherever, wherever we are. So Pointe begins the book with her first night in a police holding cell, two days before her 26th birthday, and concludes with the morning she walks out of the prison gates. Published as a small uh, four and a half by six and a half inch volume by On Press, it's just, I hold it up to give, to give folks a sense of, of the material object of the book. Uh, published by, by An, which is a progressive literary publisher in Thailand. She details her daily life behind bars, the intimate and difficult intersections of her life with those of the many women she meets and the special surveillance and suppression she faces as a Les Majest prisoner. She writes in the first person plural pronoun we in all they could do to us because when she was arrested, she was accompanied by both a little demon who urges her to challenge power and argues with her throughout the book and a tiny bird of hope and freedom. She tells the bird to fly away before she walks through the imposing prison gate, but the demon stays with her inside. There's also another unspoken meaning of the we that she writes in and the us in the title which is all Thai people who lived through the coup years. In the book and in, uh, in her over two years in prison, she writes and writes, paying the black market price of 300 baht or approximately 10 US dollars, 20 times the usual price outside to obtain the gel ink pens that she likes in prison, which she notes in the book, she wears around her neck um, as a necklace of gel pens. After an account of her early days makes it out of the prison as a letter to her lawyer and was then published, the prison authorities are incensed. 
Um, and actually, we've seen in the past couple of weeks, they've been incensed with uh, the dissemination of writing by current prisoners through, uh, through social media and other forms of media. They seize her writing materials and forbid her from writing. Similar to Liao Yu Wu in Bullets and Opium, real life stories of China after the Tiananmen massacre, who describes his life in China as a cycle of writing and then writing the same story anew each time the authorities seize his manuscripts or computer, Porndhip's form of standing in defiance is to continue to write. She writes, quote, the seizure of our writing cannot stop us from writing even though we do not know how we will send it out. They seize it and we will write it again. They seize it once more and we will write it once more." Unquote. She watches and records every aspect of prison life. Prisoners must never be physically higher than the wardens. If a warden walks by, the prisoner must crouch down. The arbitrary exercise of power goes hand in hand with hierarchy to instill a sense of powerlessness in prisoners. Prisoners are allowed to use towels after bathing, but will be punished if they leave the towels wrapped around their hair when they leave the bathing area. Yet this is not only a book that recounts a litany of repression. Um, in banned women writing and political detention, Barbara Harlow argues for the singularity of prison writing and calls for a new mode of reading. She writes, quote, reading prison writing must in turn demand a correspondingly activist counter approach to that of passivity, aesthetic gratification, and the pleasures of consumption that are traditionally sanctioned by the academic discipline of literature, unquote. As I translate the book into English, I find myself wondering what an activist mode of translation might look like. What is most essential, I think, is to listen to Pontip and to translate with her admonition in her preface in mind, in which she writes, quote, prison is likely to be a terrible, desolate place to those who hear our story. But in reality, for me, it was also something new. We do not wish for sympathy. Even if you read this entire book cover to cover, a book that we ourselves do not know how to define, and you gain some understanding of what happened in that other world, you still will not feel what we felt. Even though you think you get it, there's no way to feel it. So please enjoy and take pleasure in the sorrow that you already imagine. And may your heart be unveiled by the powers of the people who stood with us in the darkness, unquote. It means translating with the humility of not knowing what she felt, knowing it is impossible, and yet trying to convey it nonetheless. A comment Pontip made about her experience with human rights organizations after her release offers another elaboration of what such an activist counter approach to reading her memoir might look like. She commented, quote, they were of a type. Today, this organization, that one, then another. They invite victims to speak with them. But I have to say that my commitment to them was zero. First, I did not feel like I was a victim. Second, I detest being looked at like I am a victim, being looked at with sympathy and pity. You must have nightmares. Hello, it was more entertaining than you think in that prison, unquote. And for those of you who haven't read the book yet, to highlight some of these moments of entertainment in the book, she highlights the importance and the, truly the, the great significance of eyebrow pencils, writes of how to slice onions when one has no knife. I invite anyone to try doing so with a piece of dental floss. If you're me, you won't be able to slice the onion. Humorous tales of creating havoc in a sequin applying factory, the many uses of rubber bands, how to look at the exact right moment to see illicit sex underneath the clothes racks, her own beautiful golden paper handicrafts, and the sisterhood of the arts rooms. All they could do to us calls on readers to comprehend both the injustice she experienced it's important to never forget that she was placed behind bars for performing a theater play 
and her refusal to be anyone's victim, whether of the junta or those who claim to support her. This is evident both in the details of the narrative she constructs, as well as the very form of the book. So there are 32 unnumbered pages inserted into the middle of the 852 numbered pages. These pages contain actual size facsimiles of the writing that Puente completed in secret, hid, and then sent out of the prison through equally clandestine ways. The reader must either squint or use a magnifying glass to read her accounts of cruelty from wardens, fear about what would happen to her, but also her dreams and hopes, which were as dangerous as the accounts of brutality in the eyes of the prison wardens. One of the things that becomes very clear throughout, throughout the encounters with authority that she recounts in the book is that prisoners are not supposed to dream of a better life for either themselves or their society. So I noted at the beginning that this book became an immediate bestseller and has remained one. In June of 2019, the online site, The 101 World, named the book the most readable of the year. At an, and at an event uh, to, honor, to honor the book at the Ritzy Central Embassy Shopping Center in Bangkok, a member of the audience stood up, identified herself as a staff of a fashion magazine, and then said that she read the book and felt like she was reading about her own life. Just over a month ago at an event about the book at the Kanak Galna, the progressive movement, other readers said the same thing. This is the brilliance of the book and why it is a book that is at once a memoir of one woman's experience in prison and a super sharp analysis of Thai society and politics far outside and beyond uh, the prison bars that offers readers a manual or a guide for not only survival, um, but dreaming up a different society. And a big piece of this is that Ponte doesn't accept any of the dominant frames offered, either by the state or many activists. I also want to highlight a very concrete example of how the book um, has been turned into to very concrete, uh, concrete action um, as well. This is, uh, these are two, two adaptations of the book late last year uh, during the protests. Many of you will remember the Hamtaro themed protest. Uh, Hamtaro is the, the sunflower seed loving um, cartoon. And these are two of a series of graphics made by an activist artist from the information contained in the book about how to survive the first seven days of being locked up. There's a lot of information in these, in these two images, but let me share a few key pieces. First, when you're in the police station, wash your hair because it might be a few days before you get bathing things in prison. So to avoid a greasy, itchy head, make sure to wash your hair when you can. Second, create a code to use with your people outside in case you're harmed inside the prison and you don't want the prison authorities who are going to be listening to one's conversations with one's family and friends to know. And then third, the water in prison is full of minerals. Don't waste your money on shower gel. Buy bar soap and dissolve it in water. It will work much better. But this book is also, uh, I'd like to argue, the first volume in a new history or herstory for the new society that is emerging. Adan Hongchai wrote that the 14 October 1973 movement was at once a political and intellectual revolution that transformed existing paradigms and necessitated new ways of approaching the past or new histories. The events of the 10th of August, 2020, which have already been discussed, and my guess is that Adan Bajak will also discuss them when Rung Panusea Sitijira Watanakun read the 10 point declaration to reform the monarchy of the United Front of Tamasad and Dictatorship, and the broader protests that began last July and are continuing are another moment in which the Thai past has changed and new histories and herstories are needed.
This is certainly a history in which the people, not the lords, not the monarchy are at the center. But I think it is, I think it is more than this. In this case, the first book of such a new history, which I use as shorthand to signal the almost complete absence until recently of women from either Thai left or progressive or democratic histories. I have to include myself in this. Um, I did an undergraduate minor in women's studies, but if you look at what I've written, I've actually, I've mostly written about uh, male thinkers, male activists. So I, I, I hold myself uh, as, part of, as part of what needs to be critiqued as well. But the first book of this new history was published over a year before Rung read the 10 point declaration. The scale, solidarity, and constant pushing of boundaries in Pon Thip's All They Could Do To Us is why the book is the first that offers a new account of and urgent voices of the past. Even though Pon Thip laughs whenever I tell her that I think she is a historian, I urge you to read the book and draw a different conclusion. Like the people's history that Howard Zen calls for, Pointeup does not let her readers accept the history offered by the state. Her persistence, her continuing to write, is both the form and one of the messages of this history. For others who choose not to accept the state's version of the present and the past, she offers a guide of how to survive because the state repressive apparatus replete with the webs of monarchy and military is not going to let up easily as we have seen in recent months. So with that in mind, I conclude by noting that after Article 112 prosecutions slowed down in 2018, the use of the law has returned since late 2020. According to ILAW, there are at least 64 people facing Article 112 charges. Nine people are currently being held without bail while awaiting trial. And then there are at least five people currently serving sentences. I wanna conclude by noting that we cannot talk about Thai politics, uh, repression and the possibility of a just future, however far off that just future seems as though it may be, without remembering the individuals living behind bars while we do so. They are daughters, sons, mothers, fathers, sisters, and brothers. Intellectual work, any kind of academic work cannot release them. But I also think it cannot go on without acknowledging that they are behind bars for expressing their thoughts and opinions. Thank you. This has been a, a great session. So many interesting questions that we really wanted to cover. Absolutely uh, fascinating. Um, I wish we could, could go on and on. Don't forget, everybody, we will continue tomorrow, same time, same place. So it will be um, 9 a.m. New York time and uh, 2 p.m. Central European time. And uh, I believe that makes it 8 p.m. Um, Bangkok time. But don't go away if you are, have an appetite for more. We didn't want to silence our audience and confine you to speaking only in the Q&A box. We are going to have a virtual reception. Athena has sent you a link to the virtual reception. We've never done this before, so it's a total experiment. You'll go into little groups, your breakout groups of about six people per group and have a chance to talk. Um, and it's like a real reception. If you become, for whatever reason, less than excited about the group that you're in, you can walk out of the group, go back to the main room, and we'll put you in to a different group, just as though you'd walked around and encountered some different people or made the excuse that you needed another drink or snack and, and left the circle that you were in and went to, to join a new one. And we'll rotate the groups every every 10 minutes or so. So we're trying this out just to see, uh, so that we can have more of a conversation with the speakers and the, uh, the participants. So uh, please follow the link that Athena has sent you to a different Zoom group where we will be not in this webinar format, but we'll be in a, another group format and then we will put you into um, little breakout groups to have some informal discussions. So please bring your refreshments and welcome next to the um, Thailand Update 2021 virtual reception. Thanks so much, everybody, and hope to see some of you there and see some more of you tomorrow. <laughs>